So this lecture is an attempt to make up for a deficit of recording on, on let's see, goodness, uh, Wednesday and Thursday of last week regarding the Comitia Centuriata. Um, I'm going to possibly repeat myself a little bit on this, um, but try to do so super swiftly so that I don't leave anything out um, before we move on all the way um, past the discussion of the assemblies. Uh, this last most complex of the assemblies that we're discussing, again, was um, an assembly made up of every single citizen organized um, by social class. Eventually, it was organized by social class um, in a manner that had no regard for military service. But in origin, the Centuriate Assembly, or Comitia Centuriata, reflected Rome's division of its citizen soldiers into centuries or groups of 100 men for fighting purposes. And that organization, again, in the early militia, citizen militia of Rome, incorporated uh, social class as a consideration of um, what equipment you were able to provide for yourself and fight with. So uh, early on, resulting from the organization of Rome's military, but eventually being uh, rather separate from uh, practical military matters and instead focusing purely on social class um, with its categories of wealth and um, political experience as determining factors in which century an individual belonged. Every citizen could participate in this assembly and it decided important matters such as uh, election of higher magistracies the magistracies which carried imperium with them. Um, also, um, the confirmation of laws uh, passed out from the Senate um, was conducted in the Comitia Centuriata, where every citizen could theoretically have a say. The challenge with the Comitia Centuriata, however, is the way it was organized in social classes. Um, as we move on to the next slide, there were, through most of the Republic, a subdivision of this assembly into 193 centuries. Now the word centuries has no tie whatsoever to the concept of 100, but it just became a classification that, um, a name for this classification of group people into one of 193 groups. Citizens were assigned by social class, um, but were not done so in a way to produce an equal allotment of citizens per century. Um, in essence, uh, this was a system that was skewed to favor the very rich, as subsequent slides will show, um, with the Centuriate Assembly operating in a fashion that awarded one vote per century. Thus, there were a total of 193 votes possible. But because fewer higher social class citizens were assigned to each century and more lower class citizens were assigned to each century at the lower end of the social ladder. This created a, uh, an imbalance that gave more proportional power to the citizens of higher social classes. Okay, the, this, this disproportionate power um, uh, assigned to the higher social classes in this assembly. It's probably something that will become clearer on the next slide, but hang on to it um, for now as a, as a concept. Um, one of the effects of this is that essentially the Comitia Conturiata had a structure that gave um, um, many advantages to Rome's wealthier social classes. Um, one of them was the assignment of citizens to the century, but a second one was um, the patron-client relationship, which it's important to recall, even though it is not primarily a political relationship, but is instead a, a social and some some cases a familiar one, familial one. The patron-client relationship where more powerful Roman citizens, those with greater wealth and access to um, political influence and legislative, or I don't want to say legislative, but had the ability to defend clients in law courts, um, those patrons could in 
a return and often did in return for providing access to courts and so on for their lower social status clients. Uh, those higher status patrons would often expect and count on their clients to vote in a fashion that the patron recommended. Um, add to that the point made in the last bullet uh, point here that we we have is our um, we have a variety of sources that describe voting procedures and all evidence from them leads to um, pretty strong certainty that the higher social class centuries always voted first and this is worth thinking about in terms of the mechanism of getting several hundred thousand Roman citizens into the campus Martius organized into pens. They're actually put into sheep pens of uh, varying sizes um, for each century. And you had to show up in the right pen for your century when it was time to vote. But that when the voting began, it was the uh, citizens in the wealthier centuries who got to go first. And um, one of the benefits of voting first can be if um, the, those centuries voted with enough consistency of, an, of opinion. The impression that every century was voting for a certain candidate or voting in a certain direction. In other words, higher class centuries had fewer members. They voted first. It was easier to count their votes to announce the results of those centuries even before it got down to, say, the middle tier centuries and their turn to vote. So in some cases, the impression of the uh, election outcome would already, um, how should we say it, be conducted in such ways to favor the candidates favored by the higher social classes. All right, I'm um, going to push on to the next slide, which aims to give a graphic presentation to the imbalance of population of Rome and uh, votes in the Comitia Centuriata. The left table, where you see the cursor flickering, um, shows the percentage of the population, relatively speaking, of um, the, in the pink, the top social classes, including patricians, senators, equestrians, making up maybe, maybe in the most favorable circumstances, 10% of the population. Below them, next 20% of the population represents wealthy plebeians. Remember, plebeian doesn't mean dirt poor. Proletariat means dirt poor. And there were fairly wealthy plebeians whose um, political and other economic interests often were closer to those of equestrians and senators than to their fellow members of the plebeian class. If you look at the left chart, they represent 30% of Rome's population. However, in the way that their, that population was divided up amongst the uh, membership in voting membership of the Centuriate Assembly, you can see that the, the top 10% of the population, senators and equestrians, received 18 centuries or had 18 centuries allotted to them. That's nearly 10% of the vote, um, which is maybe not too striking. But as you look further down the chart and you see that the, the top half um, economic wise of the plebeian class, they, they I shouldn't say the top half, the top 20% of the plebeian class economically, um, they had a full 80 centuries allotted to them. And together, the pink and the blue voting blocks totaled 98 centuries and 98 votes out of the 193 in the Centuriate Assembly. Um, put it another way, if you take the top social class, the patricians, uh, patrician senators, um, they represent just a tiny, tiny fraction of Rome's population, um, less than half a percent, much less than half a percent. And yet they get a full century's vote assigned to them. And that similar disproportionate allotment of votes to population began up here, but carried on down the chart. So that in the top century, you might have 
this is not a real number, but it's a representative number, 300 members in the top century, 300 citizens represented in the top century. But down here in the bottom century uh, of the proletariat, and this bottom century would be the plebeians, sorry, the proletariat, those who have no uh, voting, uh, so no real property. The proletariat in Rome might number 300,000, and they would get one vote collectively. Whereas up here, 300 wealthy citizens collectively get one vote. Down here, 300,000 citizens collectively get one vote. So the big point to this is to say that the, the Comitia Cantoriata as a really important body electing praetors and consuls, high elected officials, and confirming um, decrees of the Senate when they needed to be confirmed to convert them into laws. It was a system that was very much uh, in favor of Rome's wealthier classes and people affected by poverty, greatly by poverty down here, had much less of a, an opportunity to get measures favorable to them through the assembly. Okay, I'm gonna to try to motor here because I'm already running on too long. To talk about the Senate during the Republic is not just to talk about the uh, members of the senatorial class, but to talk about the exact um, function that appointed or um, serving senators had as a group. A reminder quickly that the establishment of the Senatus um, was conducted by Romulus and as the first king he selected 100 men for membership in the Senate and at that time membership in the Senate was hereditary. It was the patres conscripti, the, the fathers who um, were enrolled and represented their family, um, prosperous families within Rome society. And during the time period of the kings, when a senator died, he would be replaced automatically by his eldest son, keeping that position as a hereditary one within the family. After the expulsion of the kings, the Romans, um, in addition to beginning to elect government officials, decided that membership in the Senate should not be hereditary. Um, and qualification for membership in the Senate was changed. Along the way, um, also the number of senators changed. It grew to 300 men in the early Republic. Then in the 80s BC, one of Rome's uh, leading political figures at the time increased the size of the Senate to 600 so that it could be more broadly representative of the um, growing population of Rome and also because the jobs that people in the Senate had to do were beginning to grow in number as well so that um, having 300 would have been too few to run the government in anything like an effective way. All right, um, the Senate after the expulsion of the kings became the, the, as it says up here, the spine and nervous system of the government. By spine, I mean to say that it was largely unchanging. Whereas elected officials changed every year, membership in the Senate was broadly speaking for life. Once you were selected as a member of the Senate, you would have the potential to hold that position for life barring misfortune of various sorts. So permanence like a spine. Also, the Senate did a lot of the thinking within Rome's government. As we're going to see, its job was to advise Rome's elected officials to preliminarily debate and consider and weigh new laws and to also you know, determine matters of war and peace and whether to um, initiate a, a military action or accept a peace treaty and so on. All right, getting to the membership of the Senate in the Republic. Now, as I said, during the Republic, membership in the Senate was no longer hereditary within families, but instead the Romans approached a sort of more merit-based system where new senators were appointed from the ranks of Roman officials who had previously held the office of quaestor. In other words, 
and I know we need to talk about the quaestorship, but once a person was elected quaestor and served out their year as quaestor, they became eligible for membership in the Senate. So that if the number of senators dipped below the desired 300, um, the Senate would um, choose from the ranks of ex quaestors new men to become senators. And this created a certain sense of mobility as people from um, families that hadn't been senators before, if they were able to get elected to the office of quaestor because of their talent and abilities, they would then become eligible for membership in the Senate. Okay. Senators continued to meet the needed um, minimum property qualification of a million sesterces during the majority of the Republic. And as it says up here, membership was normally for life or until retirement or um, until misfortune, such as, um, uh, well, there are a number of things that could cause a person to be kicked out of the Senate. Um, you lost uh, a great deal of money and no longer had the property to meet the qualification requirement. Um, also, some senators lost their position because of moral lapses. Um, and indeed, some people lost their citizenship because of moral lapses. Onward. Um, as I said, the Senate was the primary body for discussion and consideration of new laws. And once approved by the Senate, um, they were usually, though not always, carried to the uh, Comitia Cantoriata for a final vote of ratification. The Senate discussed and voted on other crucial matters, for example, war and peace. And when they issued a decision, that decision was called a senatus consultum. That decision was binding on the elected magistrates. So for example, if um, a consul um, brought up with a Senate the, the possibility of um, putting a citizen on trial for a certain crime, if the Senate said, yes, you should do that, um, and they, they formalized that in a decree or senatus consultum, then the consul had to follow through on that um, legal prosecution. Another important power of the Senate worth noting um, is that the Senate was responsible for assigning the men or citizens who would serve as governors of Rome's provinces. Um, they regularly chose ex-consuls, people who had held the position of consul and filled it well, or ex praetors, those who had been elected to the office of praetor and again performed it admirably, they were uh, assigned to act as governors of Rome's provinces. And the, the specific term that was used, if it was an ex consul, when he was governor of a certain province, he was known as a proconsul because he's acting pro consula in place of a consul. And similarly, if an ex praetor is elected governor of, say, Oh, um, Macedonia, um, that governor would be the pro praetor or pro praetoria of Macedonia, acting with the authority of a praetor in place of a praetor in his province. All right, onwards. Magistracies. Magistracies are broadly speaking elected offices. In some cases, you can be appointed as a magistrate in ancient Rome. But uh, for now, we're going to uh, think of them as elected offices, which in the Republic had a fixed term, many one month, sorry, one year terms, a few lesser or greater terms. They had defined powers and um, powers that, you know, you couldn't necessarily um, change or alter at will. It's also worth noting that um, throughout the Republic with one exception, the magistracies always um, involved election of at least two men to that office who would hold that office simultaneously so as to create a balance of power within Rome's government so that no one individual could become too powerful. These elected offices were chosen by voting in the various assemblies. Um, in the case of the praetor and consul, they were chosen in the Comitia Centuriata. Many of the other positions were chosen in the Comitia Tributa. Okay. For upper class Romans of traditional, uh, sorry, not traditional, but long term senatorial status within their family, 
there is a typical sequence of three magistracies or three offices. Um, that sequence was called the cursus honorum or course or ladder of offices. And um, just for the sake of uh, discussion here, that set of three offices was quaestor, praetor, and consul. And it's defined somewhat more broadly on the subsequent slides, but I wanted to say that here. Of the magistracies, which many of which are on, listed on the handout and in Eke um, it's worth knowing that of the regular elected magistracies, only the positions of praetor and consul possessed what is called imperium. Imperium is the legal authority to command citizens in war and to order punishment, physical punishment of a citizen. Um, imperium basically translates into the power of life or death or the ability to substantially alter a person's life by, say, for example, confiscating their property, stripping them of citizenship, and so on. Magistrates with Imperium were attended by a group of bodyguards that were sort of a combination of secret service and marshals. Um, these bodyguards were called the lictors, and the lictors um, had the, the responsibility to physically protect the praetor or consul. They also, um, if the praetor or consul ordered the arrest of a citizen, it was the lictors who performed that and um, conducted the person to a trial. The lictors bore the fosces, um, this symbol made up of a bundle of rods surrounding an ax. Um, uh, one of the lictors always bore the case in procession in front of the magistrates with Imperium so as to make clear symbolically that life-altering power of the magistrate. Um, on the left, uh, this is the flag of one of the cantons or small geographical regions of Switzerland. Um, Switzerland long controlled by the Romans. Uh, Anyway, one of the regions of that country chose the Fosces as the symbol of their canton or district. Uh, within the flag of the state of Colorado, you can also see a representation of the Fosces, which for uh, many governments after the Romans came to symbolize the legal authority and control that government can exercise over its citizens. In ancient Rome, it is thought that the bundle of rods greater in number than the single axe in the middle, represented the combined power of the magistrates to physically punish with a beating or a whipping, thus the rods, um, a citizen who broke the laws. And that that type of punishment would happen much more frequently and in greater number than punishment by death represented by the axe which is bound in the center and is, is sort of represented as an option of least resort. It's also thought that the Fosces um, may represent strength in numbers or the strength produced by um, unity of purpose as the many individual rods and the ax handle would be easily broken on an individual basis, but bound together like this, they maintain a strength and um, uh, well, strength that individually on their own they could not have. Um, also, a brief detour that some of you might consider fascinating um, is the the adoption of the Fosces as the symbol of extreme and we would say harmful government authority in the Italian dictatorship of Benito Mussolini who went back to ancient Rome um, and took the Fosces as a symbol of the extreme governmental authority that he claimed over the life of his citizens. And historically speaking, the concept of fascism um, as a form of government represented by Mussolini's Italy, Franco's, Fernando, uh, Francisco Franco's Spain, and Adolf Hitler's Germany, well, that political movement of having government control every almost every aspect of their citizens' lives uh, came from this symbol of Roman governmental authority. All right, um, but it's a perverted version of the Romans' view of governmental authority. Moving on, we're going to hit 
the magistracies and the cursus honorum um, and to try to do this super efficiently. Um, much of this is self-explanatory, I hope in the bullet points, um, except to remind you that um, these are magistracies that are elected. The first value represented in the bullet point represents the number of quaestors who were elected each year. Um, they were elected by the Comitia Tributa or Tribal Assembly. And their function was um, taxation and finances. Some of them stayed in the city of Rome to oversee the central treasury of Rome. Many others, however, were assigned to the governors of various provinces to be the financial officials within the distant provinces. And they worked under the authority of their um, appointed governor. They oversaw taxation and finances, paid for military operations as part of that responsibility, and um, paid for administration of the city's government in the city of Rome itself. Um, late in the Republic, a minimum age for election was set at 31. Um, and I won't go into more detail about that, but I, I have things to say, but now is not the right time. Also, it's good to note that ex quaestors were, um, after they finished their term of service, and if they did so well, they were eligible for selection to the Senate. It was, by the way, a requirement of these elected officials that after their term, they s submit, um, if not before the end of their term, um, at the end of the term, they would submit an accounting, uh, you know, a physical accounting of the income that they collected through taxation and their outlay of funds in service of the government. So um, again, the Senate monitored the effectiveness and honesty of the quaestors. Onward, you have the position of praetor. Um, these were eight men elected annually by the Centuriate Assembly. I want to remind you that the Comitia Centuriata appointed the magistrates who had imperium. They, uh, praetors, primarily had a judicial function. They oversaw the operation of the judicial system. Theirs was the lowest office with imperium. And you can connect the idea of the ju judicial system with um, the need to perhaps punish Roman citizens who have broken the law. And um, that administration of punishment was probably the, I don't want to say the least important, but um, it was certainly not where they spent most of their time. Indeed, they spent most of their time convening juries, um, which often were as large as 500 men. Um, and so getting 500 men organized to sit in a jury and to hear a trial that might spread over three days requires some strong logistics. They presided over the trials. They set the order of the speakers. They um, determined what evidence could be accepted and um, what evidence could not be brought in and uh, set the timeline for the trial. As magistrates with Imperium, they were attended by lictors, but it's worth noting only six lictors, um, although one of the lictors bore the Fosces in front of them. Note the minimum age for election was 40. Um, much later than the minimum age of a quaestor because the Romans considered the legal system so very important. They wanted the men in charge of it to have acquired a lot of experience, not only in prosecuting or defending clients in law, in law cases, in other words, not only acting as an attorney, but through years of service as senators um, one of the functions of senators, which I did not mention earlier, was that for a large part of Rome's history, it was only senators who could serve on juries at trials. This is very different from how the modern U.S. works. But through the experience of sitting as a jury member on trial after trial after trial through the period of eight or nine years, someone who had been quaestor, then served as senator, and thus served on juries, would gain enough familiarity with the operation of the law in Rome that they would be able to manage that operation well. And so, again, that's why the minimum age for election was so high. 
it is worth noting that there was one particular praetor who had additional functions beyond the judicial, and that was a special praetor called the urban praetor. Um, the, he was in charge of the city's safety and security at times when Rome's consuls were outside of the city on a distant military campaign, for example, or if the consuls were killed in such battles, the urban praetor was um, in charge of the physical safety and security of the city, and he regularly had a detachment of troops. Um, these troops came to be known as the Praetorian Guard, um, and they were in charge of the city's safety and security under the authority of the praetor. Um, and just as a piece of trivia, this um, body of troops later became the bodyguard for Rome's emperors after the Republic was replaced with rule by emperors. So um, that's more or less it on the Praetor. Consuls, super quickly. Um, well, actually, I can't do this quickly. There were two men elected annually by the Centuriate Assembly. Again, notice that even for these highest elected civil and military officials, that there were always two of them where the plan was that there would always be two of them, so that they could act as a counterbalance to each other if there was a disagreement or if there was a particularly ambitious Roman who wanted to seize control of the government. The Romans had had so much of rule by one man, so much rule by kings, that they did not want to have that circumstance arise again and so in having the chief elected civil and military officials always be in office in pairs, there was the hope of counterbalancing that tendency that some Romans had to try to take over. Um, chief civil and military official means that in all matters of legislation and enacting the laws and um, enforcing the laws, um, the consuls had the highest level of responsibility and power. Normally they would rely on other elected officials like the praetors to take care of such things, but if they could not, the consuls had the authority to step in. Militarily, when Rome's territories were threatened, the consuls were in charge of the armies to defend those territories. Um, you know, as we often talked about during the history of the Punic Wars, it was consuls like um, Terentius Varro, who led the Roman army at the Battle of Cannae and, of course, died. Um, but it was in his function as consul that he was leading the army there. At, after the death of Varro, you had the rise of Quintus Fabius Maximus, who, as consul, imposed, or I don't want to say imposed, but persuaded the Senate to adopt the strategy of delay, delaying preventing, sorry, delaying slash preventing open conflict with Hannibal. In addition to their military function, the consuls, um, and really this was their primary role, was to convene meetings of the Senate when there was a matter that needed the Senate's um, input. Um, the consuls were there to convene meetings of the Senate and to speak first in those meetings. The two consuls took turns. One month it'd be Consul A who spoke first and then followed by Consul B the next month they'd alternate, so the Consul B um, spoke before Consul A. The meaning of the name Consul relies in the idea down here in this bullet point of consulting. Consuls were not supposed to make snap decisions all on their own and change Rome's government or launch an invasion. Okay? They were to consult with members of the Senate to help to shape the Senate's decision by speaking first, but always listening to the Senate and following the final decision of the Senate. Um, in addition, they presided over and convened meetings of the Centuriate Assembly, whether the Centuriate Assembly was ratifying laws or conducting the next election of the next year's officers. Consuls were attended by 12 lictors, twice the number of praetors, and again preceded by the fosces. The minimum age for election set at 42 is important because of a factor about life in the Republic that it's worth bearing in mind. The Romans were, I'll, put, I'll use the word allergic 
the Romans were allergic to having people in high elected office become professional officers. In other words, they took pains within the operation of the Republic to do two things. Thing number one, to um, broadly speaking, allow elected officials to hold that elected office only once. So you were quaestor once and then you were done. You were praetor once and then you were done. The second um, way that they tried to prevent people from becoming professional officers was by requiring a that a candidate for elected office not be in office, even a lower office, at that point in time. In other words, it was necessary to take a year off between being praetor at the age of 40 and then seeking election um, for the position of consul, which you could do only when you were age 42. So this forced a year off, and basically the Romans were suspicious of having someone who was holding high office and holding power, having the advantage that that power brings with it when seeking a later office. In Rome, it became, um, well, I don't, I don't wanna say this, but in Rome, it eventually happened that some people were able to seek reelection, but that was viewed as, as wrong and different. Um, which is very much counter to our idea of uh, of politics, where um, congressmen can seek re-election, congresswomen, senators can seek re-election while holding office, or um, someone like our current governor could consider running for election as a senator at the same time that he's the current governor. All right, um, last bullet point mentions the fact that it became sort of traditional in Rome to identify years, especially recent years, by the names of the two consuls. So the Romans would say things, the year when Cicero and Hybrida were consuls, to refer to the year 63 BC. Um, it was simply easier than the other way the Romans had for reckoning years. All right, um, tribunes of the plebs, super quickly. Um, this was a magistracy, an elected position created after the secession of the plebs to give lower class citizens the ability to protect other lower class citizens. There were 10 elected annually by the tribal assembly, by the Comitia Tributa. In other words, no patricians, no senators took part in the election of each, the tribunes of the plebs. And the tribunes of the plebs had themselves to be plebeians. They couldn't be of equestrian or um, senatorial status. The tribunes had two powers to protect the common people of Rome. One was the power we know as the veto. The Latin word veto means I forbid. And in a meeting of the Senate, if the Senate was considering a law that would be harshly punitive to the common people, a, a tribune could stand up and simply say veto, I forbid. And that law could no longer be carried forward for further discussion or could not in fact be a law. It, it could never pass into the state of being a law. The second um, power of the tribune was called sacrosanctitas or sacrosanctus. It was the, the feature we talked about earlier about how the physical body of a tribune was considered holy and inviolable and the tribune could place himself between arresting officials and other plebeians to prevent the arrest of that plebeian um, for the time being anyway. All right, um, in Rome's Republic, people who started off being of plebeian status could um, gain access to higher political office with the position of tribune of the plebs as their starting point. Um, if they came from a non-equestrian, non-prominent senatorial family, but gained uh, a reputation for fairness and justice or effectiveness and honesty as a tribune of the plebs, they might garner enough support eventually to perhaps make a run for quaestor and thus gain access to higher elected office and even senatorial status. Okay, um, the position of idol will be discussed in a subsequent uh, video, so I'm gonna stop talking now.
I hope you're uh, doing well. Bye.